see it? Yeah. Interesting. Therefore, he is called smaller than the smallest. As the supreme, he can enter into the atom and into the heart of the smallest and control him as the super soul. Although, so, so there, right there it says, and into the heart of the smallest and control him as the super soul. Although so small, he is still all pervading and is maintaining everything. By him, all these planetary systems are sustained. We often wonder how these big planets are floating in the air. It is stated here that the Supreme Lord, by his inconceivable energy, is sustaining all these big planets and systems of galaxies. The word achintya, inconceivable, is very significant in this connection. God's energy is beyond our conception, beyond our thinking jurisdiction, and is therefore called inconceivable, achintya. Who can argue this point? He pervades this material world and yet is beyond it. We cannot comprehend even this material world, which is insignificant compared to the spiritual world. So how can we comprehend what is beyond? Achintya means that which is beyond this material world, that which our argument, logic, and philosophical speculation cannot touch, that which is inconceivable. Therefore, intelligent persons avoiding useless argument and speculation should accept what is stated in scriptures like the Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, and Srimad Bhagavatam and follow the principles they set down. This will lead one to understanding. So, that's very, very important statements here. Very important purport. Everyone wants to bring Krishna down to their level. That's because they don't understand how great Krishna is. Like, let's say, a uh, basketball player, Shaq O'Neal. You know how big he is? He's over seven feet tall. So you think you could compete with him in basketball? <laughs> Well, in the same way, even more so, how can someone compete with Krishna? How can people be so arrogant to say that they're an incarnation of Krishna? And there's hundreds, thousands of people like that in India that claim that they're an incarnation of God. That means they have no understanding of who God is. And then, if they don't have any understanding, how about the people that follow them? They have even less understanding than the so-called guru. But if you read Bhagavad Gita, then you begin to comprehend a little bit how great Krishna is. And this is not, you know, even if you try to describe from our own limited mind greatness, we wouldn't even come close to this. He simultaneously greater than the greatest and smaller than the smallest. You can, either, you, you can understand conceivable oneness and conceivable duality, but you cannot understand simultaneous con, uh, oneness and duality. You can't understand that. Uh, simultaneous and inconceivable oneness and duality. Just like Krishna is, is in the heart of the, of the jiva. And our soul is one ten thousandth the tip of a hair. Krishna is smaller than that. <laughs> At the same time, he expands his body to the virat rupa, which contains the entire material creation. But there's not only one material creation, there's hundreds of millions of other material universes. And he's expanded into every atom of every one of those universes and into the heart of every living entity. How can we even compare to that? There's no, it's inconceivable. Okay, so we're back on chapter 2, verse, what, 20 something? 20. 
Okay, so the individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. So here we're going to have definitions by affirmation and definition by negation. So affirmation means you're making direct statements of what something is. And negation means you're also saying what it is not. Right? So who's going to read the proof for you? Who was me? Okay, let's start with Augusta. Go ahead. All these qualifications of the atomic soul definitely prove that the individual soul is eternally the atomic particle of the spirit world, and he remains the same atom eternally without change. The theory of monism is very difficult to apply in this case, because the individual soul is never expected to become one homogeneously. So what does homogeneously mean? Um, it means um. <laughs> what it means, um. I don't know. Well, okay, so that's an honest answer. That's good. Homogeneous means, it's the, let's break it up into words, into a syllable that says homo, and genus. So homogeneous means oneness. Uniform. Huh? Uniform. Uniform. So it's impossible to therefore say at the same time that the individual soul is unbreakable and it's everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. So the, the Mayavadis, they say that whatever is being perceived now as individuality is actually an illusion, and there's only one soul, and that's this homogeneous one soul. And whatever we perceive as many different individuals, it's actually an illusion. And when people overcome their illusion, then they merge back into that one soul. So that's a vial that, that, that would uh, be a contradiction of this verse. The verse says that the individuality of each soul is unchangeable. It's an eternal. And you can't break it. And it can't be burned or dried. Or, you know, so therefore, there's no such thing as merging into a oneness, a homogeneous oneness. That's, that, see, Mayavadi philosophers, they say, that the whole world is an illusion. But they don't admit that their philosophy is also an illusion. If they say the whole world and everything is an illusion, that means that their philosophy is also an illusion. But they don't admit that. They want to purport that their philosophy is all right, but everything else is an illusion. So in many ways, the Mayavad philosophy is irrational. It doesn't make sense. But it is very convenient for people who are frustrated with material life. So I think I've given this example before. If a person goes to a dentist and says, oh, oh, doctor, my tooth hurts so much. Do anything so I never have a toothache again. And the doctor says, anything? I said, yes, yes, I don't care, anything. I never want a toothache again. So the dentist goes and gets a circular saw cuts the guy's head off. He'll never have a toothache. Now, is that an acceptable solution to his problem? No. no. But that's the Mayavadi solution to suffering. They say you annihilate your individuality, you'll never, no longer suffer. You merge back into this homogeneous oneness. The whole thing is preposterous. It's, 
it's, it's as crazy as Stephen Hawking saying that there are black holes in the universe. It's, it's there just, aren't black holes? No, there are not any black holes. You, you have no way of knowing that there is. If you go into the black hole, you don't come out again. <laughs> See, it's just like saying that the cyanide doesn't have a taste. Why? Because it, as soon as you taste it, you die. <laughs> What's cyanide? Cyanide is a poison. It's a very lethal poison. As soon, as soon as it touches your tongue, you're dead. So no one's ever tasted it before because they died before they could explain what it tastes like. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you want to be a theoretical physicist, you keep coming up with theories that are impossible to prove. That way you get a PhD. Because no one can disprove it. <laughs> it's just a theory. So Hawkins was a theoretical physicist. That means he kept coming up with theories that were unprovable. So as long as you can't prove it's right or wrong, you think the guy's a genius. Right? Okay. What is this theory of monism? Monism. Monism means oneness. So the Mayavadis think there's only one soul. And all what we see now is many different individuals, and it looks like everybody has a soul. They say this is all illusion. And when you reject everything material, and you meditate like 24 hours a day, you merge back into that one soul. So basically, it's like suicide. If, if I throw you into the fire, right? and your body burns, and you die, and you merge back, you know, you become ashes, and then ashes merges back into the earth. So is that a solution to happiness? Is it, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous philosophy. So what do they say, why they're um, in the body? What do they have to say about it? They don't have a plausible answer why we came to this world. There's no, no realistic answer. See, look, look what Krishna is saying. Krishna is saying your soul is eternal. It was never born, it will never die. Right now it's trapped in a material body that's subject to birth and death because we revolted against Krishna. Therefore we put into the material world, but we're given a chance to go back again if we understand what is our relationship with Krishna and act properly. So, because your soul is eternal, you can remain eternally in the material world, making the same mistake over and over and over again, birth after birth. But you won't only be in the whole human form of life. There's 8,400,000 species. So you could be going through birth and death in all those species until you come to the human form. In the human form, you have, it's the only chance you have to get out of this, of this birth and death samsara cycle. But if you become convinced that the, uh, through public education and university education that the goal of life is sense gratification and you can be happy by eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, then you waste the human life, and you and you go back into the lower forms, and they have to come back again to the human form. You know, all the time suffering, birth, death, old age, and disease. Does it make sense? No, it makes sense because the soul is eternal. But my body says the soul is eternal, but there's only one soul, and all the different souls you see is illusion. It's not real. Do you think your child is not real? Huh? Your child is? He's not real. real. He's, he's independent of you. Yeah, but do you think he's real? Yes. Yeah, of course. But if you read Mayavad philosophy, you think he's not real. You think you're not real as an individual. So what is their definition of reality? Reality is Brahman. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya. Do you understand the words? Brahman is real. 
and the jagat, everything in the material world is false. That's what they say. That's their philosophy. Because it doesn't stay uh, like, for good. The regular sense of bread like, develops here and ends here. Yeah. That's on the material level. That your soul, is it eternal or is it also... It's eternal. Yeah, so uh, this is, until you understand the difference between the soul and the body, you're confused <coughs> about what is the goal of life and how to attain it. And most people stay confused their whole life. They never figure out there's a difference between the soul and the body. Then what is the difference between Brahman and Jagat? Well, the Jagat means the material world and Brahman means the spiritual world. So they do believe in the spiritual world. But their understanding of it is it's homogeneous oneness. There's no individuality. And they say that you cannot attain this oneness unless you reject Krishna, because Krishna is the sum total of tamasri buddhi, intelligence and ignorance. That you have to actually reject Krishna as an individual, as an individual person, in order to attain Brahman, their concept of Brahman. You never heard that before. Huh? No. Okay. So when Prabhupada says You never met any Mayavadis? I know met. Huh? Yes, I did. Well you ever ask them what their philosophy is? They don't know. I they don't know. What do you mean they don't know? How do you know they don't know? When we ask them what is like what is this difference exactly? Yeah. When they call it as everything is virtual, right? And Everything is what? Virtual? Yeah. That means it's not real. Yeah. But someone explained that to you. Did someone explain that to you? Huh? No. No. Are you just, what, speculating now or what? No, no. Like, it didn't, I didn't understand it completely, but when I talked to them, this is what, like, you know. Okay, you did talk to a Maya body. Yes. And they explained to you. So from their definition, that's why I thought that they are Mayavadis, right? when they don't believe. Okay. Most, most of the, the gurus that come from India are Mayavadis. Even the ones often that who say they're Vaishnavas. If you sit down and talk to one, if you find out they're actually Mayavadis, right? they don't have a clear understanding of who is uh, Krishna or Sriman Narayana. There's not a clear understanding. In other words, they follow Chaitanya's path, but Sankara's math. <laughs> yes. So that's a play on words. Sankara's, you could say math, like in English, or mat, like in Hindi. What? Shankaracharya, is a, he, he's recognized as a realized soul, right? Well, he was a realized soul who had a difficult mission. His mission was to throw the Buddhists out of India and reestablish the authority of the Vedas. Because for a thousand years, the Vedas were rejected in India. Since the advent of Buddha, and then especially since... Uh, the Emperor Ashoka converted to Buddhism. Almost all of India became Buddhist and they rejected the Vedas. So Buddha himself said that my philosophy will be valid for a thousand years. So a thousand years after Buddha came Sankaracharya who reestablished the authority of the Vedas and basically threw the Buddhists out of India. And then but Sankaracharya, see, he did it by teaching a veiled Buddhist philosophy. And that's why he was able to convert them. But he reestablished the authority of the Vedas, but he gave, him, gave the Vedas a Buddhist type of interpretation. But he reestablished that the ultimate nature, ultimate goal is Brahman. 
the spiritual effulgence. Whereas Bud through Buddhism, you don't reach Brahman, you reach Nirvana, which is the negative side of material life. The positive side of material life is you're attracted to so many different things. The negative side is you reject all those things and you attain a, what's called an absolute inertial state. No desires, no uh, suffering, but no happiness. At least in the Brahman realization, there's happiness, some happiness, because there's no more suffering and there's this spiritual light. But you're not aware of it because you have to deny your individuality. So both the Buddhists and the Mayavadis are atheistic. They deny the individuality of God. They deny their own individuality. Okay. <coughs> So, but Sankaracharya's last instruction was Bajaguvinda, 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 Mudamate. Give up all this word jugglery and just serve Govinda. So his own followers did not follow his final instruction. Because he had written Janath Ashtakam, he had a real, um, did the Sthapana of uh, Jagannath in Puri, like he was given to Something, but like he did a lot of things in Jagannath Puri only, Sankaracharya, because he was giving so much of importance to Jagannath. So obviously uh, you can't deny that he don't... Um, His followers did not follow him. Yeah, no, they didn't actually. Yeah. He was told by Narayana to come to this world, is actually incarnation of Lord Shiva, and bewilder the Buddhists and reestablish the authority of the Vedas. And he did it. He's a brilliant, brilliant person. But to do it, he had to preach a Buddhist type of philosophy or interpretation, a Buddhist type interpretation of the Vedas. And, uh, but then his final instructions were Vajjagavinda. But his followers didn't follow him. Which, which philosophy is the worst out of Buddhism and Mayavadi philosophy? Which is the bad one? Well, see, the worst, the Mayavad is worse because they specifically say, and this was not Sankaracharya, this was his number one disciple, Sadananda Yogendra. He wrote a book in which he specifically said that Krishna is the sum total of ignorance, Tamasabuddhi, which is just completely insulting, right, and wrong. So Mayavadis are the worst aparadis, the worst insulters of the Supreme Personality of God. So they say God has no legs, no tongue, no eyes, no ears. That means he's paralyzed, he's dumb because he can't speak, he's blind because he has no eyes, he's deaf because so he can't hear. Right? They, they, they just insult Krishna up and down. So although they follow some spiritual principles, sometimes they're even stricter than devotees in following uh, principles of tapasya, jnana, and so forth. But yet, their philosophy leads you to a dead end. What do they do? Are like Mayavadis, are they like vegetarian or stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. They are? Well, except for the followers of Rama, Rama Krishna. So they do, they're, they're not vegetarians. But the other, most of my bodies are. So they do what we do, but their philosophy is all wrong? Exactly right. They yeah. don't offer Krishna. Huh? They, they, don't. they don't offer the Krishna. I was telling no, no, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they even give lectures on Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. They interpret They interpret Yeah, they interpret it in their own way. Oh. <laughs> Mayavad philosophy is the ultimate fake news. You ever hear fake news? Yeah. <laughs> it's the ultimate fake news. And it's done in such a, uh, let's say, uh, scholarly way that you can't, even, you can't even imagine that they're faking. You don't know what they're talking, but they're 
talking like big, big stuff, so you just believe it? Like for most people, yes. No, see, my Bhagavad philosophy is very good for people who are suffering and, and are willing to take a, make a radical solution to suffering, see, like Buddhism. Like if you have a toothache, you know, and the doctor and you say, I do anything I don't never want to do for the toothache again. So the doctor cuts your head off. So that's that's my Bhagavad philosophy is like that. It's very similar to Buddhism in the final end. The final end is you deny your own individuality. Basically you you become a non person. So basically you're you reject that you're like a person in your yes. life. Well no, you you, you reject your individuality by going into deep states of impersonal meditation. So ultimately, okay, when you buy a ticket, let's say you want to go to Philadelphia, okay. but you buy a Seattle Metro ticket, you have a ticket. How far will that ticket get you? To the Seattle Metro? Yeah, it won't get you past Seattle. But you think this ticket will take me all the way to Philadelphia. So my philosophy is like that, you know. All the, path leads to the same destination. Huh? All path leads to the same destination, but it won't. So okay. the Mayavadis. No, all paths don't lead to. That's what they say. Yeah, they say that. Prabhu. Huh? But that's what everybody says, right? You follow any religion, but you reach the same destination. How? Oh. you have loved Does that make God. sense? <laughs> what if your religion is Rajneesh's religion? That's <laughs> bad. <laughs> Will I lead you to the same destination as someone who's a sincere devotee, Krishna? No, of course so it's not. So basically, the Mayavadis want to um, approach the same goal that we do, but except um, no, they don't. They, they, have wrong they don't want to. They don't want to reach Krishna and Goloka Vrindavan and Gopis what, and cows. What's the point? I told you that it, it's, it's a type of philosophy that people who are suffering and want to put a final end to all suffering, even if it's a radical solution like cutting off your head, uh, they, they accept it. Like, I mean, some people who suffer a lot in life, uh, I remember seeing my father, for nine months he suffered from lung cancer. He'd be screaming at night. And finally, he, he was just saying, just give me poison, I'm going to end this, I don't want to live anymore. So there are people like that who, who, who have suffered a lot and, and, and they're attracted to, these, to Buddhism or Mayavad philosophy because they see that as a radical solution to suffering. If you're no longer a person, then how can you suffer? So the, the same thing is promised in Buddhism as well as in uh, Mayavad philosophy. Now, on the other hand, devotee accepts suffering. Yeah, I was thinking of suffering. Devotee accepts suffering. It doesn't. They have to be humble and tolerant. Yeah, devotee does not, uh, you know, let's say, run away from suffering. Or he accepts it as, as the mercy of Krishna. Now, what does that mean? First of all, let's look at the Pandavas. The Pandava's best friend is Krishna, right? Yeah. And look how much they suffered. They had to go into uh, exile 12 years, and then one extra year they had to be incognito, unseen. And then after all that, then they had the war. 16 days or 18 days of, of horrible war. That's it. And, and then after that, they had to take care of all the people who were left homeless and, not homeless, but whose husbands were dead and, you know, there's children and there's wives and it was, just, it was a mess, right? And they had to deal with all that and they, de they dealt with it, but it was terrible, right? They didn't reject the pain. Huh? They didn't, like... No. No, and then one day Narada Muni met... Uh, Krishna and he was talking with Krishna a little bit jokingly but serious also I said Krishna I said something I don't understand I said you're the Pandava's <coughs> personal 
friend, relative, you're their guru, and look at all the bad things that happened to them. They lost their kingdom, their wife was uh, insulted, and they had to go into, into exile, and then they had to go incognito, and then they had this terrible war. And he said, uh, I don't understand. He said, I thought, I thought you were the protector of your devotees. And Krishna just smiled. He didn't say anything. And then finally Narada Muni said, yes, he said, but I did notice something. The more they suffered, the more they depended on you. And the more they became, uh, let's say, let's say closer to you. Again, Krishna smiled. Then Narada Muni understood that this is not the same type of suffering as a materialist, that it was part of a plan of Krishna, and his devotees accepted it. And they waited patiently, and they did what Krishna said, and they came out successful in the end. But they went through a long period of uh, difficulty. Now look at Ramachandra, he's Krishna himself. Look at all the trouble he had. He had to go into exile 14 years. His wife was kidnapped. He had to fight a terrible war to get her back. And he lived in the, in the jungle for 14 years. So therefore, <clears throat> what is Krishna telling us by, by this? What is he telling us? Theory of karma is <clears throat> What? Theory of karma is unavoidable. The what of karma? Theory, theory of karma. Theory. Theory of karma is unavoidable. I don't First of all, karma is not a theory. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a theory, we'd be back with Stephen Hawking, you know, <laughs> theoretical physics, you know, coming up with theories. That's not a theory, it's real. But the suffering of devotee is not necessarily due to karma. <clears throat> And so that's what Narada Muni realized also. It wasn't really the, the karma of the Pandavas. It was Krishna's plan. Isn't it? Uh, doesn't, um, don't devotees suffer because, like, um, I don't know, Krishna wants to test them? When I was little, they used to say, like, Krishna was going to, like, test them to see, like, if they go through so much pain, they'll be like, Krishna isn't helping me. I'm going to leave Krishna consciousness. <laughs> no, you got it all backwards. Yeah, I learned that when I was little. Who taught like, you that? Who taught you? I don't know, I just heard it. And yeah, well, that's not true. No, no, now we're talking about a real example of Pandavas, right? Was it their karma that caused all that, let's say, difficulty? No. No. Krishna, see, when Krishna puts his devotee in difficulty, he is, it's not karma, it's a plan of the Lord. In the end, the devotee will be glorified for not abandoning the Lord. And what you were told is that when you, when you go through all the suffering, then you question your allegiance to the Lord. That means you're not really a devotee. A devotee knows nothing can happen without Krishna's permission. Yes, bro. From the suffering is a check of humility. It's what? A check, check, check of humility. A check. Check. Check mark. Check. Test. Test and hope. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, you can say that, but a devotee does always takes either success or failure as the mercy of the Lord. In success he thanks the Lord, in failure he thanks the Lord. Because he says, this is, you know, as you said, a chance for me to be really humble and accept this and become more attached and more strict in my following of the Krishna consciousness. See, the only shelter we have in this world is surrender to the Lord. There's no other shelter. Now, if you surrender to the Lord, the Lord promises that He's going to protect you. 
So actually, suffering is a good thing because you surrender more to the Lord and He will protect you. I guess you're experiencing that now, right? Yeah. So you should take it as the Lord's mercy. Most people, when they suffer, they say, this is because I'm worshipping Krishna. Right? If I'm worshipping Shiva, this would not happen. <laughs> So whoever told you that in the Synergy School, that they gave you the wrong information. When I was little, some um, some kids were talking, and the teachers also, they told us that, I can't remember who, but like, they were telling us like, Krishna wants to test you and stuff. Yeah. Well, what's... Yeah, even he knows. He test you something. in what way? What's the test? Um, to test you if you would like... Um, if like you got like, if you were suffering a lot, oh my god, it's because I'm um, worshipping Krishna and Krishna isn't protecting me. In the Bhagavad Gita it says Krishna will protect me. But what's the test though? And the test is like you have to go all this pain. That's the test. Some difficulties day to day life. So they're questioning it whether well, well, God's supposed to protect, but He's not protecting this either. That's what he's saying. No, but that's what that's he's saying. But that's not the test. <laughs> no, I think it's he's... Back to the Krishna. <laughs> so the second is that protect. That protect to yeah, go where exactly is that protection? What kind of protection? That's a dilemma. Yeah. yeah, if you like, um, if you lose faith or something, yeah. like. But if you lose faith, then you lose the test. You, you, yeah, you exactly. fail the test, right? Yeah. So that's why I keep asking, what's the test? Test is to eat a chocolate or not. That's the test Krishna gives, yes. Chocolate? How do you bring chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> because for okay, the kids, so. I think Krishna might test them by giving them chocolate and see if they're tempted to eat chocolate or not. Now you're... <laughs> no, that's not. That's not. Uh, you, went, went, oh, you went off the topic completely. <laughs> No, the test is, the test is, you have to see that suffering, like for example, if someone insults you, does it hurt you? Well, if it's like him, no, but if it's someone else. Him? <laughs> well, he can insult you, you can insult him, is yeah. okay? And it doesn't, have you insulted him recently? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, it doesn't bother you when he insults you? Not really. Okay, well, let's say your enemy insults you. Well, yeah, I'll get mad. Okay. So, what actually is insulted? Is it you or something else? Uh, yes. Actually, he might be insulting your body, but not your soul. Well, yeah. Yeah. Look, look. Let's read this verse again. You read the verse. What's it say? So, can your soul be insulted? Then? No. Based on what we just read. I'm saying like he can say like he can insult your body, but he can insult your soul. So, therefore, it's your false ego that's insulted. You see. Now, when you when you suffer, when you suffer, is it your soul that's suffering? No. No. Again, it's not. It's not you. Right. So how is it that devotees can tolerate suffering? It's because they're they know that they know that it's not them. It's like just they know that I'm not this body. Know. Neither yeah. am I the mind or the intelligence or the false ego or the arm or the leg or the ear or the nose. I'm something different. It's a soul, and the soul is unchangeable. Unable to be burned, insoluble, not able to be dried, everlasting, all-pervading, unchangeable, immovable. This soul is eternally the same. So, if you get insulted, have you changed? No. No? Yeah, well, <laughs> no. Yeah, you've changed. Wait, what? Well, your soul didn't change. 
No, but but your 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 false ego changed. Yeah, it changed from being happy to being uh, angry. But but your soul hasn't changed. See? So as long as we identify with the body, either and there's two bodies. There's the gross body and the subtle body. The gross body is made up of earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And the subtle body is made up of mind, intelligence, and false ego. So what usually gets insulted is this subtle part of us called the false ego. And the anger is, again, experienced first in the false ego, and then there's what's called psychosomatic symptoms. What affects your mind then affects your body. And then you start breathing heavily, and your face gets a little red, your eyes start bulging, you start breathing, you know, heavily, and your chest expands, and, you know. So th there's physical consequences to this subtle uh, disturbance to your, but your soul is the same. It didn't, it didn't, you know, you can't, it doesn't really touch your soul. It, it's touching all these other subtle areas of your uh, uh, false identification. So the devotee, just like when Prabhupada was asked about Jesus, he said that he did not really suffer on the cross. People got shocked. The Christians got really shocked by that statement. You know, because it, it says that he was suffering on the cross for the sins of others. But uh, in the same way with Haridas Thakur, did he actually suffer when he was beaten in 21 uh, marketplaces? And then uh, they thought that he was dead, and then they threw him in the Ganges, and he floated down the Ganges. So did he actually suffer? You know the story, don't you? you know? So what's the story? Huh? He was protected by Lord Chaitanya. Yeah. How do we know he was protected? How did he know he was protected? Because Lord Chaitanya showed him at the end of Prakash, there is when he showed this, this form to all the devotees, the leader, and he showed on, the, on his back still the markings of the, of the beatings. Not so when they were beating Haridas Thakur, he wasn't actually feeling it. The Lord was accepting yeah. it. For because him. he covered him to yeah. get the beating. So you see, some mysterious things happen when one is a sincere devotee, right? Even though Jesus is, looks like he's suffering on the, on, the, on the cross, he's not actually suffering. Because his mind, his consciousness is somewhere else. Right? Same with Haridas Thakur. All the time they were beating him, he was chanting Hare Krishna. And he was smiling in a sense. And, and the guards that were beating him were really shocked. Then they begged him, please die, otherwise we'll, we'll die. He said, oh, I don't want you guys to suffer. So then he dies. He actually dies? He enters into Samadhi, so they think he's dead. They throw him out. He, he goes into the state of Samadhi, I guess. And they throw him into the, into the Ganges. What's Samadhi? Samadhi means when you are so concentrated on Krishna that even your bodily symptoms are uh, almost stopped. You hardly breathe. It looks like you're dead, but you're not. When Lord Chaitanya first saw Jagannath, Lord Jagannath, he went into a state of samadhi. So yes. then, uh, <coughs> uh, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, the head of the Jagannath temple, had him brought into his private room. And he wanted to see if Lord Chaitanya was a real, was in real samadhi or not. So he took some thin uh, piece of cotton and put it under his nostril. And he saw that he was slightly, very slightly breathing. Then he realized this is a real, a real samadhi. Because for a normal person, they would think he's dead. So Haridas Thakur went into a state, like a state of samadhi, and they thought he died. They threw him in the Ganges, and he floated down. Then he got out far down the river. And Prahlad Maharaj also was in samadhi. What? Prahlad Maharaj, right? He was. Yeah, Prahlad Maharaj. Kavankar tried to kill him. 
Well, he was thinking of, he was, he was, well, it's a little bit different. He was always thinking of Krishna. He didn't like, look like he was dead. He was always fixed in his meditation on Krishna. Therefore, see, like, if you're, if you're in a, a cave where there's all poisonous snakes, and you just chant, you don't open your eyes or anything, you're not looking at the snakes, you're just chanting. So you get into the chanting so much, you forget where you are, right? And, and therefore you're not afraid. But if you know, you're just there like frozen and looking at the snakes like this and wondering who's going to bite me first, you know? <laughs> and you're shaking and, you know, eventually you'll get bit. So Prahlad was always meditating on the Lord. So, you know, even if he was thrown into a cave full of snakes all around him, nothing happened to him. So, and sometimes that happens. Like sometimes there was this one African girl, she ran away from home because her parents wanted to uh, mutilate her. Mutilate her. Uh, in the Muslim countries, uh, young girls are mutilated. They, they cut off parts of their body so they can never, never feel any happiness. And so she didn't want that. So she was only like, I think, 14 years old. She ran away from home. And, and this was in, uh, in Africa. And she ran through the jungle. And finally, the, you know, her parents couldn't find her. And she was exhausted and she just fell asleep next to a tree. In the morning when she woke up, there was, a, there was a lion right in front of her, looking at her. And she just froze. And apparently the lion had already, it was well fed, let's put it like that. So it wasn't really interesting, he was just curious, what's she doing here? So she just looked at him and then she was so frightened, you know, she was like petrified. She just closed her eyes like that. She was expecting to die at any minute. Then the lion just walked away. And somehow or other she escaped. And then one thing led to another. Eventually she ended up in England. And then she became a world famous uh, model. And then she wrote a, a book about her, her life. Right. So you see, sometimes you get so afraid you just freeze. Right. And just close your eyes, and, and you know. But in the case of Paul Maharaj, he was focused always on Krishna. So Krishna protected him. Nothing happened. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't attached to his body. He was just attached to Krishna. Yes. Uh, it's cool. Like, they they teach like to like at the beginning of school, like in case like. If they have to, wait a minute, you're speaking too fast and mumbling. I can't understand what you're saying. Go slower. Slow down. Slow. They told about stress, like about tests and stress. They talked about like stress. Stress during tests. You know tests. A stress test. No, no, no. You get stress during like tests. Yeah. Oh, during tests. And then they talked about like this, like. Amygdala part of your brain. A what? Oh, yeah. Amygdala. 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 It's a part of your brain that gets stressed. Yeah. No, it's like, it, it's like, like a run. Wait, no, it's, it's like fight, flight. It's like fight, flight, or run. If you're scared, if you feel like a threat of stress or like frightening, you've like the option to fight or run. Yeah. 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 Y
Are they telling us not to do it? Like you can not to do what? Fight, fight, or flee. Well, so what are they telling you to do? So like, uh, don't be like a victim of it. Like actually try solving it. Oh yeah. Try to. So so what he means like um when when something um, happens. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. What he means like um. So what I'm saying is like for example like if you have like a test problem, not test problem. Okay, if you smell bad, so you you make well, there are problems. You smell bad. Okay, it's, it's just that example. Okay, you get you get stuck tomorrow with problems. <laughs> we went from fight, flight, or freeze to smelling bad. <laughs> no, it's just an example. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow. So, what, what we should learn today is, it should be like Prahlad Maharaj, always chant Hare Krishna and depend on Krishna. You don't have to worry about fight, flight, or freeze, or smell bad, or smell good. <laughs> you, just, you just chant Hare Krishna and depend on Krishna. Right? And that way, somehow or other, some wonderful thing will happen. And you, you will be free of stress. Okay, so, we finished. You read this uh, purport? No. 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 Go ahead. After liberation from material contamination, the atomic soul may prefer to remain as a spiritual spark in the effulgent rays of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the intelligent souls enter into the spiritual planets to associate with the Personality of Godhead. So the Mayavadis want to, they prefer to remain as a spiritual spark in the effulgent rays of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Oh, yeah. That's my Vat philosophy. But the intelligent souls enter into the spiritual planets to associate with the personality of Godhead. So, if you are a space and and you had two choices. One choice is you can fly toward the sun. And, and the other choice is you can land on the moon. Which one would you take? Can you repeat that? I would, I would land on the moon. I don't yeah, land on the moon. Land, land on the moon. On the moon. Right why, the why not just fly toward the sun? You would die. You would burn and die. Yeah, because it, first of all, you would never reach it. You, you would burn in the way. So what, this is what the Maya bodies do. They want to merge into the sun light. Right? And the devotees, they want to go to the, through the light to the spiritual planets. So unless you land on a planet, you just can't stay flying around in space infinitely in, in the light or flying toward the sun. Eventually you'll, you'll burn. So, uh, therefore, the Mayavad philosophy doesn't make sense in any way at all. <clears throat> Even a practical sense, I mean, if you take a rocket out into space and you just fly toward the sun, and you'll eventually, you know, become incinerated. But if you go to the moon, land on the moon, you have a chance, at least some chance, of surviving. Right? It's not really the moon. Actually. How, why do you say Isn't it like the moon is like, you have to, um, the moon that NASA landed on isn't actually the moon or something? Okay, we'll discuss that tomorrow. That's another big discussion. So, Prabhuji, yes. Yes. so Krishna is here. Krishna is here. He has all this evidence. Yes. Mayavadis are saying that we will go and end up here. Yeah. They want to merge, merge, merge into the effulgence. So, they will be somewhere here in this uh, effulgence. Yeah, because they don't believe that there's spiritual planets. Well, there is, for them, there is no spiritual plan. But where are these things coming from? There is just, just the light. There is just, just the light. From Krishna's body. Okay, for, for Prabhupada, when he says we are part and parcel of Krishna. Yes. So we are this spiritual, this part is, is he talking about? Like, mm -hmm. in what way we are part okay. and parcel of Krishna? Okay, part and parcel of Krishna. You, we are never separated from Krishna. We believe we are, because we're in Maya. Uh, but when, just like, for example, Let's say you're sitting at the dinner table, and while your husband is eating, he's watching television, right? 
and you're talking to him, and he's not talking back to you. He's watching the television. So is he there? No. He's, he's there. Yeah, he's he's there. Physically is there, but <laughs> mentally he's not there. It's, it's somewhere else, right? So my bodies are like that. They, they, they don't pay attention to what the Vedas say. They just interpret it in a different way. And they miss the whole point. That there, there, there's no such thing that you can merge into, you deny your individuality, merge into the light, and you're going to be happy. There's no happiness there. There's just, there's just a, a neutral state. You see. So, so in other words, in other words, your husband is there, but he's not there. Because when you're talking to him, he's, he's not listening to you. He's like watching the news. Or he's watching a cricket game or something. So my bodies, they're, they're not focused on Krishna. They're focused on the light coming from the body of Krishna. Well, if you, like for example, when there's an eclipse of the sun, if you watch the eclipse of the sun, what will happen? Your eyes. You go blind. Yes. People go blind. It damages their eyes. You don't realize how powerful the light is coming from the sun during an eclipse. Therefore, you're not supposed to look at the sun when there's an eclipse. You will definitely go blind. Or you'll damage your eyes in an irretrievable way. Did you look at the sun on an eclipse? Yeah. You did? Lunar eclipse. No, no, not lunar eclipse. Solar. Solar eclipse. Is it solar, is it solar glasses? So th this is what happens to the Maya bodies. They, they get blinded by this uh, meditation on the light. And uh, eventually, they don't believe that there are any spiritual planets or that Krishna is an eternal person, etc. They just believe that the, they merge into a light, they lose their individuality, and that's it. That's the ultimate state. Okay, so let's finish then. Go ahead. The word Sarvagata. The word Sarvagata, all pervading, is significant because there is no doubt that living entities are all over God's creation. They live on the land, in the water, in the air, within the earth, and even within fire. The belief that they are sterilized in fire is not acceptable because it is clearly stated here that the soul cannot be burned by fire. Therefore, there is no doubt that there are living entities also in the sun planet with suitable bodies to live there. If the sun globe is uninhabited, then the word sarva gata, living everywhere, becomes meaningless. So this is an example of spiritual deductive reasoning. Anybody know what deductive reasoning is? Besides Sergei. <laughs> you know what deductive reasoning is? Yeah. That means you don't know. Okay. You eliminate the possibility and come to the conclusion. That's how the reduction happens. Okay, Sergei, so what's deductive reasoning? You know, okay. What's deductive reasoning? Similar to what you said, but not correct. I don't understand. Deduce basically. Yes, By some evidences, you can deduce the conclusion. Give an example. The non, non. I know deduction was used a lot in Sherlock Holmes stories. <laughs> so one example, like an example. Examples like the uh, like, uh, 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 it would be like what was explained right now. That, Okay, look at the purport, the, what thing. we just read. Yeah. Tell me what the deduction is. So probably Prabhupada's if, deduction. If there is a light outside. Okay, Sanskriti, what is it? Is it using your um, senses? No. Uh, so, so if you see a sun, a sunlight, you know that sun is out there. That's not deduction, that's inductive reason. Yeah. So here it says present everywhere. Yeah. No, go, go, pardon, last so in the, in the translation it says present everywhere. So yeah. if if the soul cannot live on the planet sun. on the planet sun, then how can you claim that it's soul living. can be present yeah. everywhere? So right. So, so you're starting you're starting with yeah. a statement of the yeah. Vedas. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you and he's deducting. Deducting yes. means 
you begin with a first premise. Yeah. And if that's true, and then the other things should follow. Right. And then everything that should follow, you check it with reality. Yes. And see, yeah, it's yeah. actually true. Yeah. Right. So, for example, all men are mortal. John is a man. Therefore, John is mortal. mortal. That's John deduction. Man. Yes. Okay? That's an example of deductive reasoning. Okay, since you have your hand up and you're not scratching your ear, what 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 is the question? Uh, is, is this kind of like a triangle, like a, a no. triangle? No. Like if you check it with Krishna and then you check it with Guru Shadi Shastra, you see. No. No, no. no here, see, what Prabhupada does here, let's go over it again. He says, the word Sarvagata, all pervading is significant because there is no doubt that living entities are all over God's creation. So sarvagata means everywhere present. Look at the Sanskrit, all pervading. So everywhere in the material world there are living entities. In the water, in the air, in the land, in fire. That's why you cannot really sterilize something simply by putting it in the fire. Because there are living entities that live in fire. They don't, they don't die. Okay, so... The belief that they are sterilized in fire is not acceptable because it is clearly stated here that the soul cannot be burned by fire. Therefore, there is no doubt that there are living entities also in the sun planet with suitable bodies to live there. If the sun globe is uninhabited, then the word sarvagata, living everywhere, becomes meaningless. So in other words, there is spiritual deductive reasoning and material deductive reasoning. Spiritual deductive reasoning is what we do. If Bhagavad Gita says something, like the soul is sarvagata, everywhere present, then we know that everywhere in, in the creation, of Krishna, there are living entities. Like, for example, scientists are still not convinced if there are living entities on the moon, on Mars, on Venus, on Mercury, on Ju Jupiter. They don't know. Right? And they speculate. They say, well, the atmosphere on Mars is not conducive. And on the on moon, there's no water. So we don't think there's any living entities there. Those are all wrong statements. If we take the, what's called a priori statements of the Vedas, a priori means they're self-evident. You cannot argue against them. So it's, if it says that there are living entities everywhere, then that means there's living entities on the moon, on Mars, on uh, Jupiter, on Saturn, on Venus, on the sun. Every, everywhere there are living entities. On the asteroids. So whether we can see them or not, why is it we can't see them? Because their body has a different material composition than the bodies on the earth. On the earth, the main element is water, and then the second main element is, is earth. So our body is 70% water and approximately 30% earth. Right? But on the sun, the bodies are... 99% fire and 1% something else, right? I mean, there's still the five elements. Earth, water, fire, air. Four elements. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. And then the three subtle elements. But they're in different proportions. Just like the proportion in the body is 70% water, approximately 30% earth, you see. But when you go to the moon, it's... 90% mind, <laughs> right? And then a little bit of earth, a little bit of fire, water, no. but it's mostly mental. It's the more subtle body. So you have these eight fundamental elements, and they can be in different proportions on different planets, according to the environment of the planet. Yes? In Brahma's body, body is made mostly of intelligence. Okay. Good. Yes. Are you just resting your hand on your uh, knee or are you raising? Okay. Yeah. 
Also, like, we read this, like, book in school, like, are you allowed about, like, sunlight? It does it relate to, like, like, some animals can live without sunlight? In a way? There are fish that yeah. live yeah. Like, two yeah. miles yeah. below the Arctic North Pole, where there's yeah. no light. Does mm -hmm. it relate to that? And hardly any oxygen at all. And they're... And there's thousands of different living entities there. Scientists say that they can't live because they don't have sunlight. Does that? They say they can live. They say they can't live on the moon because they don't have this, that, this, that. But there's some fish that live like two miles deep and they can live without this, that, this, that. Well, okay, but see, those type of... Uh, Discussions. Those, no, those type of discussions go nowhere. However, if you accept the Veda, Vedic truth, it says Sarvagata, they are living entities everywhere. Okay. Whether I see them or not, I know it's a fact. And as my ability to see and research, don't put your fingers in your mouth, right? Then it's my ability to see and research improves, then I'll, I'll see that the statement is actually true. Right now, because I'm limited in my ability to see things, I might doubt this statement. But when you accept the statements of, of Krishna as uh, a priori truth, that means they're self-evident truths, then you don't doubt it. And you save yourself a lot of uh, research and time lost. Uh, trying to figure things out on your own. Okay? Okay, so... Hey, one point, yeah. What does it mean by souls immovable? Immovable? Is, hmm? Immovable? Or, immovable. How, how do you understand that? In what sense? Are you, are you talking about well, it's like... Uh, if there's something you can't see, can you move it? I mean, you can see the body, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you play football, I could, my body is bigger than yours, I bump into you and I move you, right? But I don't see the soul, so how can I, how can I move it? Yeah. It does take, like, so when you die, right, from one body, you transfer to, or you take other body, so with respect to that. The soul is moving, he's saying, it's transferring from one place to another. Do you see it? So something you can't see, something you can't measure. So how would you know if it's moving or not? But moving? we state the fact that soul can take the multiple bodies. But isn't yeah. it that soul has a super soul? The super soul can move the soul. Like, so, soul okay, now wait a minute. After, Let's not speculate. So that's a that's a question. Is, is soul alone after uh, body passes? No, because it seems in the. Okay, let me tell you why it says it moves. All right. Because we've actually never left the spiritual world. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, that's you want to explain that? No, I wouldn't I would be able to, but I understand the point. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's just like when, uh, yeah, when we <clears throat> are sleeping, right, but the mind is still working. So we have a dream. We're walking down the street in Hong Kong. People are speaking Chinese all around us. And you're feeling lonely, saying, oh, I'm so far away from home. Then you wake up and you realize, my God, that was just a dream. It looked like it was real. Did you move? Were you in Hong Kong? No. So actually, right now, we never actually left the spiritual world, but we became involved in this uh, phantasmagoric dream. I am this body, I'm in this material world, this is my family, uh, I was robbed yesterday, I had an accident, and uh, I lost my job, and now I'm going to move back to India. And, and it, when you wake up, you realize this whole thing was a dream, but it seems so real. So, we actually never left the spiritual world. 
our mind has been drawn into this uh, illusory state to think, you know, this is my body, this is my family, even though I've been born hundreds and millions of times already, right, in different bodies. So, when you begin to uh, understand the nature of forgetfulness of our real identity, then we, it's like we're in a dream world. It's a, now, right now you're experiencing something. Tonight when you go to sleep, this will seem like a dream. And you'll be in some other conscious state, right? You'll see different things. You're back in India or you're on an airplane that's going over the Amazon or something, right? And then when you wake up, that's a dream. And then now, you know, you're doing this thing and that thing. So Prabhupada said there's a daydream and a night dream. During the day, we're dreaming I'm doing all these things. At night, I'm dreaming all doing... You know, at night, I think the daydream is a dream. And during the day, I think the night dream is a dream. So then they asked Prabhupada a question. He said, then Prabhupada, what is real? If you say this daydream and night dream, what's real? And he said, Krishna consciousness is real. Everything else is like a dream. Because you did, you mean, let, let's say when you were a young boy, you had a grandmother and grandfather. Now you're, you know, much older. You don't have a grandmother and grandfather. Right? You don't, well, at least you don't see them anymore. They died. Right. So all the experiences you had with your grandmother and grandfather when you were a young boy, it's like a dream. You see. And Krishna consciousness, however, is real because in Krishna consciousness there's no more linear time. Past, present, future. There's only the eternal present. That is real. This past, present, and future is like a dream. It's only in the material world. It's only in the material world. In the spiritual world, there's no past, present, future. There's just the eternal present. Yes? Prabhu, um, I, I hope it sounds like a vision, but immovable could also be that it cannot be moved by external force. So on its will can move, but it cannot be moved by someone, so it's immovable. No, no. <laughs> uh, okay, there are different theories. Yeah. <laughs> because they say, the yogis, huh? the yogis who meditate, huh? the yogis, uh, when they do the yoga, so they, they can move the soul from below, below top, and they can go here, and then it goes out of the head. Yeah. So it moves in one body also. When they know how to do it, right? They raise the level chakras. Come to the top and then they leave the body. But it's a dream. So it's moving the body. That's the daydream or the night dream. No, I mean, Krishna consciousness is real because it can be never, it can never be destroyed. Anything that's subject to time is is going to be like a dream. After it's over, and it's over quickly, then it becomes a dream. You see. So therefore, we should all, that's why Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, uh, 20th verse, Nasato Vidyate Bhavo, Na Bhavo Vidyate Sata. No, no, not 20th verse, uh, 14th verse. No, no. 14th verse. 14th? Yeah. Uh, no. No, not 14th. Uh, 16th verse, second chapter, 16th verse. It says, those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, this, the material body, there is no endurance. And of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. So let's read this purport. Okay, who's going to read? I can read. Okay. There is no endurance of the change in body that the body is changing every moment by the actions and reactions of the different cells 
is admitted by modern medical science and thus growth and old age are taking place in the body. But the spirit soul exists permanently, remaining the same despite all changes of the body and the mind. That is the difference between matter and spirit. By nature, the body is... Okay, so spirit is not subject to change. If it's not subject to change, and the body is always changing, so the body is movable, it's changing, it's subject to time, you see, where, where the spirit soul is not movable, it's not subject to change. So, go ahead. By nature, the body is ever-changing and the soul is eternal. This conclusion is established by all classes of seers of the truth, both impersonalist and personalist. In There's one thing the personalists and personalists agree upon. <laughs> In the Vishnu Purana, it is stated that Vishnu and his abodes all have self-illuminated spiritual existence. The words existent and non-existent refer only to spirit and matter. That is the version okay, of so all seers of truth. It's referring to matter as non-existent. Why? Because it's always changing. It's not. Therefore, it's not something real. Real is something eternal. Unreal is something that's always changing. Uh, this is the beginning of the instruction by the Lord to the living entities who are bewildered by the influence of ignorance. Removal of ignorance involves the re-establishment of the eternal relationship between the worshipper and the worshipable and the consequent... Okay, I'll read that again. Okay. Removal, removal of ignorance involves the re-establishment of the eternal relationship between the worshipper and the worshipable and the consequent understanding of the difference between the part and the parcel living entities and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, you enter into the real world, the world of reality, of eternal reality, when you understand your relationship with Krishna. If you try to understand your relationship with other things like cars and houses and materialistic people, you're not dealing with knowledge, you're not dealing with reality, you're dealing with something that is changing all the time. <laughs> Therefore, it's like a dream. It's, it's not permanent. Whereas the relationship with Krishna is permanent. Even though uh, we're living in a temporary body, but the real person is not the body, it's the soul. And the soul's relationship to Krishna is not subject to change. If it was subject to change, then everything would be unreal. So the way, that's why Prabhupada said, when, when he said, is daydream and night dream, then the question was, then Prabhupada, what's real? And he said, Krishna consciousness is real. Because it's unchanging. <coughs> it's sat. It's not asat. Go ahead. One can understand the nature of the Supreme by thorough study of oneself. The difference between oneself and the Supreme being understood as the relationship between the part and the whole. In the Vedanta Sutras as well as in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Supreme has been accepted as the origin of all emanations. Such emanations are experienced by superior and inferior natural sequences. The living entities belong to the superior nature as it will be revealed in the seventh chapter. Although there is no difference between the energy and the energetic, the energetic is accepted as the supreme and energy or nature is accepted as the subordinate. The living entities therefore are always subordinate to the supreme lord as in the cause of the master yes, and the... the, of the master. Yes, Sorry. Lord, as in the case of the master and the servant, or the teacher and the taught, such clear knowledge is impossible to understand under the spell of ignorance, and to drive away such ignorance, the Lord teaches the Bhagavad Gita for the enlightenment of all the living entities for all time. So this is a very profound <coughs> purport. This helps us to understand what we were discussing today. When, when it says the soul is immovable, it's unchangeable, it's everywhere present. Oh, these are very 
big and profound concepts. And uh, but the only way we can understand this is by first of all trying to understand our relationship with Krishna. Understanding that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and we're just part and parcel of the Lord. And therefore there's no choice but to serve Krishna because we're part and parcel of the Lord. We have no independent existence from the Lord. What do, do, does material education try and convince us? They try and convince us that we have an independent existence from God. And therefore, we have to find our own solutions to the problems of life through science and logic and reasoning. All that is nonsense. Right. But that's what we've been convinced of through material education. And because of that, we're floating around in this samsara, uh, trying to be happy, but looking for happiness in the wrong place. Trying to find out why we're suffering without getting the answer. And just hopelessly continuing going on this uh, Ferris wheel uh, up and down through the different species of life. You see? Until we understand our relationship with Krishna, we're the part and parcel, he's the whole, he's the supreme proprietor, we are simply the servants. Unless we understand these things, we'll never be able to get out of the samsara, the cycle of birth and death. And then, as long as we're interested in temporary things, we remain confused. It's only when we become serious about sat, what is unchangeable, what is immovable, what is eternal, what is transcendental, then we have a chance to find real happiness and not be affected by the misery of the world, the difficulties of the world, and attain this internal peace through this personal relationship with, with Krishna and his devotees. So this, it takes a long time to, I mean, I, don't, I can't say I understand this purport myself. There are a lot of very, very com complex uh, concepts here. And if you, if you read it carefully, you see that uh, when it says, one can understand the nature of the Supreme by thorough study of oneself. The difference between oneself and the Supreme being understood as the relationship between a part and a whole. So, how can you study yourself in order to understand God? That's what it's saying, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're part and parcel of God, then the part and parcel has the same qualitative, uh, let's say, uh, qualities that God does because we're part and parcel. Quantitatively we're different, qualitatively we're similar. So now let's look, let's look at how you analyze yourself. Like for example, do you like uh, when people are kind to you? Do you dislike people who are unkind to you. Yeah. Now we understand two things about God. When, when we're kind to God, He likes it. When we're unkind to God, He doesn't like it. You see? You understood something, of, you understand something about yourself before you understand something about God. Now, are you happy when there's relationship or genuine love. So now we understand three things about God. That God is happy when there's a relationship of genuine love with Him. So by analyzing yourself, and that's what it says here. What, read, read what it says again. One can understand the nature of the Supreme by thorough study of oneself. The difference between oneself and the Supreme being understood as the relationship between the part and the whole. 
So we can never be equal to God. Mm -hmm. We're the part, right? But qualitatively, we have many of the same qualities mm -hmm. as God does. So we have to, uh, in order to, to analyze yourself honestly, though, mm -hmm. you have to be at least in the mode of goodness. You can't really analyze yourself if, if, well, we can't analyze ourselves if we're living in the mode of passion and ignorance. It'll be, you know, like someone in the mode of passion said, well, I like garlic. Oh, that means God likes garlic. Is that true? No. Because, that, because you're, you're, you're analyzing from the mode of passion. Right? And someone else said, well, I like marijuana. That means God likes marijuana. No, it's not true. You see. So you have to be at least in the mode of goodness to be able to analyze yourself uh, in a, uh, let's say, realistic way. Right. Here, Prabhuji, like when we say, I like this, I here really refers to the spirit soul rather than the material body. Yeah. So, so like, okay. okay but if I have a big false ego, yeah. It will be referring to the false ego, yes. not to the soul. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, I was trying to understand that when we are trying to understand oneself and trying to relate it to the, the nature of Supreme, we should understand ourselves from the point of being the spirit soul, not the material body. Yeah. Well, spirit soul, you know, it's hard to uh, separate the body from the soul, right, mm -hmm. first of all. But... Uh, if you are honest with yourself, you can. You can do it. Because ultimately, uh, you will talk about things that have real, let's say, value. Like, for example, peace, happiness, and love, and immortality. These things have value, right? A peaceful mind, a happy soul and a loving soul, and immortality. These, these four things have real value. You can't, you can't buy these things. Can you buy these things? No. Trump's trying to buy peace <laughs> with China, I mean, uh, you know, or peace with North uh, Korea. You, know, you, you can't just buy them. There has to be more than simply uh, a material negotiation to attain peace. So, therefore, we have... Uh, to be able to analyze ourselves and understand things about God, we have to at least be on a higher level than simply eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Because the lion will say, well, I like to eat meat. That means God likes to eat meat. Well, no, it's not right. right. Okay. But this is a big subject. See, if, if you just read that one line... One can understand the nature of the Supreme by thorough study of oneself. Now, how do you make a thorough study of yourself? You cannot do it realistically unless you come at least to the mode of goodness. While in the mode of ignorance and passion, you will not be able to make a thorough study of yourself or honest evaluation of yourself. Okay. So, did we have homework last week? Like three weeks back or so. Yeah. Oh yeah, we haven't met for some weeks, yes. right? Yes. Two the homework weeks. was like, uh, Suresh Prabhu was supposed to defend uh, there is uh, my no own. soul, my and own. rest of the people were supposed oh, to yeah. defend there is there is soul. Well, I think wh where is the no soul man? <laughs> <laughs> He's probably still preparing notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, did did you do your homework for tomorrow? Did you homework for tomorrow? Was it write a letter to Trump? Oh yeah, write a letter to Trump? Yes. Yeah. What about this letter to Trump? Um, you have to write it about... Did you write like, it? That's the question. If no. you were, no, the question is, if you were President Trump, how would you how? bring about peace in the world? Oh, that was last week. You can't buy peace. No, no, yeah, we discussed it last week, but the homework was to actually start writing the letter to him. How you would bring about peace. Peace in a scientific way. In a scientific way. And you have scientifically forgotten, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so homework for next week. Homework for next week. Explain how you can understand the nature of the Supreme by thorough study of yourself. How can you do that? How would you start? How, by thorough study of yourself, you can understand the diff uh, you can understand the nature of the supreme. In other words, you can understand Krishna or some things about Krishna by studying yourself. Explain how you can do that effectively. I have one question, um, yes. like a personal kind of thing. So there are, um, as you said, um, there are so many uh, gurus in India, and there are so many followers of them. Of them, very prominent is Siriti Sai Baba. So there are some, uh, like, I know a couple of friends, like a couple of friends, and they follow Siriti Sai Baba. So they, they keep inviting me to their temple. And, uh, I know. Very yes. So, uh, like, I have been like, I, I have always told her to them, but, like, uh, I don't know like, how to, like, every time when I say no, is it like, uh, like, I really don't want to go. How can I tell them, like, it's not very good, like, let me put it that what? I don't want to go there. Like, they, they have a like, kid's birthday or some uh, 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 program they are doing. Like, they are celebrating certain things and they are inviting me. And I don't want to go there. So how do I tell them? Like, but they keep inviting me anyway. Well, you already told them by not going. Yeah, many times. It's been like since the, it's yeah. been established since then. Like, they invite me and then I really don't want to go. And, uh, so, it comes what? It, it, it gets into, not, not like conflicting more, like if I would invite them to Islam temple, they will try to return them, you will not come. So you don't invite them to Islam I shouldn't? No, I mean, like, okay. Uh, the reason you don't want to go there, it's because you were taught from childhood that Jagannath is God, right? So they're going to try and teach you that she decide Baba is God. So it doesn't make sense. So that's why. So should I like tell them like No, no, you just tell them. No, no, you just tell them. I love Jagannath so much. Yes, you cannot. I respect what they are doing, but you know, I don't want to get involved in their life. Yeah, I just love Jagannath so much. My child is like, I'm a tattoo Jagannath, and I can't go somewhere. Maybe some different point of view about who Jagannath is. Yeah, it hurts me too, like when they say that Sri Sayyava is just not to that. By understanding what's happening. Well, then, my reason is correct then, right? Yeah, you didn't have to tell me why. I, 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 but I can tell them that. No, no, you don't want to tell them, you know, it hurts me when you say, so you say, I'm not going to just say. I love Jagannath very much. When I go to the temple, I see my Jagannath. Yeah, many times when we they invite Rakesh and I go to the temple, and Rakesh would also say, I have commitment. I have commitment. They're nice people. They just confused about who Jagannath is. But you know, if, if, you know, if they really press you, they don't press you. I don't think they pressure you. They're just trying to be nice people. I don't want to say that they're not You know, because if I get into that, I could be very angry. No, no, you don't want. You don't want to argue with them. They're nice people. Just tell them I love Jagannath. I can only go, you know, 
have this attachment to Jacob.
But at the same time, I didn't understand why my mother was crying so much. The whole thing was just confusing. Because attachment, attachment to body, attachment to family, attachment to different things, attachment uh, here because our wishes, wishes to have sense gratification independently. And this is derived from proudness. Proudness, proud, proud. And then, uh, my body. They are not doing spiritual suicide. Spiritual suicide. They just say, you are suffering, become zero, and you will not be suffering. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. And it's very, very understandable with a small child. For example, I'm a parent, I have a child. One child, uh, very uh, 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 listen to me and uh, do it for me everything and I very really love him. Another child, not very good child, and I punish him and after that he's starting to also call. But third child also don't want to listen to me and I punish him and instead of uh, become a good boy, he uh, uh, say I will not do anything. I don't need this toys. I will not go to uh, yeah. some, uh, some part. It's like my body. They just... I reject everything. Yeah. It's also a problem. Frustration. I, I remember when I was child, I also came uh, some sometimes. Because I cannot uh, get what I want. I say, if I don't want to get what I want, I will not get anything. I don't want anything. <laughs> I mean, it's so important. <laughs> Yeah. It's so important to become Krishna conscious early in life and avoid so much suffering. Thank you. 
So, everybody should have some cake. Yeah, 
Every day when we learn something new about Krishna, I realize I don't want to do anything else. I just want to learn.
When we forget Krishna, we think suffering is normal. Death is normal. So, are we going to do the... Yes, but it's going to make up. Yes, we don't, go, we don't go to St. Peter until 3, 3 o'clock, 3.30. 3.30? Yeah. We will be ready by 11.00. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Once your body changes, you're stuck good. So, if you burn your hand, it's not going to heal. Like it. it might never heal. So you're stuck. Good. So, the same way, as long as we associate with goodness, passion, and ignorance. We, we acquire a certain nature and we think it's natural. It's not but it makes us like a prisoner. We only see the world through that condition. But unless we can break that false condition due to the modes of material nature, we remain a slave to illusion. We're never able to figure things out correctly. And we get, you know, we surrender to lust and anger and greed. They take over. Now you control the rest of the that's why Krishna consciousness is the only reality. You break off the relationship of lust and and the rest of surrendering to Krishna and taking the seriousness of Krishna. Then we have a chance to get out of the illusion. Otherwise, no possibility. Just like everybody knows politicians, partners, but yet a new politician comes and makes promises that we want to believe. And we think, oh, we vote for him, then everything will be Yeah. 
But devotional service, like, you look at what we do in the temple. Yeah, every day we have mongol arts. You know. So see you. Dressing the deities, the opening of the deities, offering for shot. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's a relationship. Yeah. So that's something real. These other things, nice. what you ate the other night, you can't even remember. You can't even remember what you ate like three days ago. Right? So is it real? It's come and gone. We forgot about it. And so many things we've done day after day, day 10, 20, 30 years. But it's past. It's finished. It's not there anymore. You're not going to get it back. So, therefore, the only, the only reality is our relationship with Krishna. Not really. It's going to come and go. It'll just remain like two minutes. Not clear. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's like a this constant repetition of chanting, reading, serving the deity, distributing the deity, preaching. These are real things. Because they're unending. After this life, you'll continue doing it. After this body, you'll still continue doing it. In the spiritual world. So that means it's real. These other things, you know, going to the football game, going to the music class, going to, going to that wedding, going to this one. I can remember a wedding I went to when I was uh, 16 years old. But is it real today? No, it's just blurred in my mind. I can remember a little bit. I remember one time, I think I was 10 or 12. My father gave a speech. I remember him standing up on the podium to speak. It's like an emotional thing. That was so many years ago. I can still remember hearing my father. I didn't understand what he said. I can still remember him. But you know, it's, it's not real. Whereas the deity is always there. Krishna is always Hare Krishna Mama is always It's not changing. It's growing. It's not Hare Krishna Mama, you know, it's Sai Baba These things are real. The other, these other things, they come and they go. They're not, they're not actually. They were temporarily real, but only temporarily. Daydream and night dreams. The only reality is a relationship with Krishna. And then, if, if we're related to other people who are related to Krishna, that's also real. This association with devotees. Yeah, that's also real because it's connected to Krishna. As soon as those devotees stop being connected to Krishna, then it becomes unreal again. Let's say someone leaves Krishna consciousness and is your friend. Oh uh, yeah, okay, he's my friend, but whatever is happening with my friend now, it's not real. It's going to come and go. Whatever is we are doing in relation to Krishna, that is real. And that is not real. Yeah, going to work every day, coming home, eating this, eating that, going to this movie, going to this class, this thing. No. But eating like eating through prasadam, then it becomes real. Because it's a relationship to Krishna. So then, people like Narayana, Hanumanji, you know. So people all the time they're in relationship to Krishna. People they have a real, they have, they're, in, they're in reality, and it's not, never stopping going on the journey. Okay, thank you very much. Bro. I tried a little bit of it. Yeah, you put pistachio. 
Yeah, that's all. Yeah, that's good. I don't like nuts. Oh, you don't? Uh, here, I like nuts. So, anyway, they're, they're salted. Oh, I see, I see. But I don't like any nuts. I don't like any
Yeah, but he didn't touch kheer and he didn't touch sweet. But he ate dhokla. Krishna ka blessing leke aai temple se?